to the St. Peter Institute podcast. I have here with me once again the Director of Biblical Theology for the Institute, Luke Lancaster. I'm Marcus Peter, the President of the Institute. So Luke, good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, Marcus. Good to see your face. Likewise, likewise. So uh, we have an interesting topic for you today. Uh, we'll be talking about Luther's 95 Theses, but in particular, we'd like to zoom into the concept of indulgences. So we're going to dial back. That's just in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, but we're going to dial back to give all of us an overarching view of uh, what we know about what led up to 1517 and, and kind of these catalytic moments that spark the Reformation. So, uh, Luke, I'm going to hand this over to you. Let's start by talking about the person of Martin Luther and, and then just build this up into the events that led to the Reformation in 1517 as a whole. Why was that such a, a pinnacle moment in Christian history? Yeah, well, actually, like, what was it, uh, three years ago in 2017, that was the 500th year anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, which was 500 years after 1517. That was the year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses against the door of Wittenberg. And, and, uh, but let's try to like unpack this and think about it historically. And like, where do we get this idea of how is that like the beginning of the Reformation? And personally, I don't really see it as the beginning of the Reformation, but it, it's like huge in everybody's mind. Everybody says it's the beginning. And the main reason that they say that's because of selling of indulgences. That's the main like key issue that people talk about for the beginning of the Reformation. Then we should definitely be talking about that and try to get an idea for it and just be historically literate to be able to talk with other people. So I would start with saying how Martin Luther was the one who grew up in what's now Germany. And he ended up getting, he went into the St. Augustine's order, the Augustinians. And he ended up going to the University of Wittenberg and earning his doctorate in scripture and teaching there. So he's teaching scripture at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. So he's a very bright, bright young man. Like he knows the Bible very well and he's talking about it. He's a professor. You know, we all know professors uh, that are like very scholarly and they know a lot of knowledge and they talk about knowledgeable things, you know. Uh, so they're, they're very bright. And so that's something that Luther would do when he's talking about theology. One of the things so during this time period is the issue of indulgences. And the fact is, the, can you imagine like going to a parish where the priest like didn't know too much about theology? If like if you didn't know too much about theology and then like the parishioners themselves didn't know too much either. Or that they were getting lied to by the priest. Like maybe the priest was uh, like some big guy from wall street and just like saw everything in terms of money and didn't think about god or spiritual things or heavenly rewards i said i was thinking about money like this is kind of like the context here of thinking indulgences people are thinking about indulgences as being the key to salvation which is totally ridiculous the church has never claimed that but this is just kind of like individual places you know like the pope can't oversee everything and sometimes the Pope isn't even all that good. It's only when he's only infallible when he preaches officially as teacher of faith and morals. And that happens very rarely. Last time I'm aware of is, uh, at least for our time, is the Assumption of Mary in 1950. Uh, so it's very rare for the Pope to be infallible. But these are individual men, and men were very sinful during this time. They were not a Mr. Holiness, okay? So we're trying to think of selling of indulgence is being a really big issue but that's just one issue there's a bunch of other issues it's like really disheartening if you start reading about how much the church needed to be reformed you're looking at simony where people are buying and selling not just indulgences but church offices like if i wanted to be bishop marcus all i had to do is own a million dollars and i go give that to bishop parks over here and boom i'd be the bishop like that has nothing to do with spirituality or God. <laughs> like, it's like, so that's a real issue. Then you got nepotism where basically like, okay, let's say I pay this huge amount of money. I become a bishop. Well, I want my brother, Mark, to be the bishop over there in the diocese of Orlando. So I'll be the bishop of the diocese of St. Petersburg and he'll be the bishop of the diocese of Orlando. Let's say I have enough money. So I give it 
to the Diocese of Orlando and make my brother the bishop there. So that way, like, we just got everything is about family ties and trying to own as much property and own as much money as possible. Like, can you imagine having a bishop like that? That would be really disheartening to my own faith and everybody's faith. So it'd be really hard. He had absenteeism where the bishop wouldn't even live in his own diocese. Like, can you imagine that? Like, can you imagine me living in, you know, I'm going to go live in New York, uh, but I oversee the Diocese of St. Petersburg here in Florida. Uh, basically, all I do is I just get taxes or I get tithes from all the people and I just gain more and more money. Like, what? You're not caring for the souls of the people like Jesus wanted his apostles to be and his successors to his apostles to be. That's what the bishops are. It's supposed to be successors of the apostles. supposed to be caring for everybody as sheep needing a shepherd. Knowing the people, loving the people, leading the people to God, telling them about confession, the Eucharist, baptism, etc. Um, instead, they're not even living in their own diocese. They don't know the people. They're just in it for making money. And you have pluralism where, get this, you own multiple dioceses. Like, think about that. Can you imagine owning, like, all the dioceses in the state of Florida, Louisiana, and Georgia? <laughs> like, What? How would you get to know anybody there? And if you were the, like the bishop of all of these people, the only like the only reason these people were the bishops of all these people is because they had the money and they wanted to like get more money. It's kind of like an investment. <laughs> like they're just they're constantly getting in money from their investments. <laughs> they bought the bishopric and now they have that's how they make money. That's it. And then here's the main issue that we're gonna be talking about today: selling of indulgences. So we're thinking about. What's going on in 1517? You got Pope Leo X, who's trying to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica. Have you ever been to St. Peter's Basilica? Mind-blowing place, gorgeous. Like it's really like the center of Christianity. It's just the center there, and it's so beautiful and so moving, and just really makes other people sense God and His presence and His beauty and His love for man and salvation. It's just gorgeous. But that's what the the Pope wanted, like. The reason we have this is because of indulgences, actually. So we're actually like the reason that we were able to like make such a massive place is because we had indulgences going on for the building of this area. And this is actually a beautiful thing if you're doing it for the right reason. Are you donating money to St. Peter's Basilica? for the purpose of wanting a beautiful place to worship God and for all the nations to see such a beautiful place and to understand your relationship with God in just a marvelous way. Like, you know, the Jews put in tons of money into their temple, right? Like the temple was mind blowing for the Jews. They had these massive golden angels in there. Like that weren't free. <laughs> that wasn't free. <laughs> or they like had these amazing paintings on the sides of the temple and the temple was just a massive structure. So you're wanting to worship God in an amazing way. And so you're putting on all this money into it. So that's a beautiful thing. We wanted St. Peter's to be what St. Peter's is like today. And that's going on. So what they're doing is they are offering an indulgence. If you are being generous with your heart and offering your money to that. So those are some of the main issues. I would say going on in 1517. Okay, thank you very much for that background, Luke. So you've told us a little bit about Martin Luther, but you've also told us about the kind of socio-political and economical struggles that Christianity is, at large was dealing with, uh, particularly with nepotism in the church. There was one particular figure and his bishop, Johann Tetzel, who seemed to be a very a very key influence uh, during this era. Would you like to tell us a little bit, just just in brief, a little bit about Tetzel and his bishop and, and how they led to Luther's doing what he did in posting up the 95 Theses? Yeah, so let's start with, a, remember, like, Germany is what we think of the area today. Back then, uh, I had a different, I think it was Saxony and Mainz. Um, so, those are some locations there, what is modern day Germany. And you have the bishop there, Albert. And again, we talked about all these issues of like buying and selling church offices. Albert was no exception there. He 
very clearly did simony and he bought his bishopric which is the air so this huge area of germany overseeing like one of the areas where luther was living and when um, this indulgence came out from the pope about how if you are being generous with your heart and you want to show that you're sorrowful for your sins and you want to give money to god's kingdom that you're going to get an indulgence well albert took that and he saw this as a money-making opportunity he was like you know what i'm going to take half of these indulgences, half of the money that goes to the, the rome i'm going to take all this money half of it's going to go to him and i'm going to take half of it myself right so he's going to keep half of it and so how is he going to get the money though? He's got to tell all the people about the indulgence. So he gets certain priests, one of which is John Tetzel. So he gets John Tetzel to go out there and he's going to make a percentage as well because you know, he is a priest. So he's needing to live as well. But the problem is that everybody becomes money focused rather than God focused. So Albert sends John Tetzel out there to tell the people about the indulgence. And now that's where, all the problems start, and this is what gets Luther going crazy. And for the right reason, Luther was going crazy for the right reason. You would go crazy. I would go crazy, too, if you would hear what's going on. Because when Tetzel's going out there to tell people about this indulgence, he's twisting the teaching of indulgences. Now, we do have to keep in mind that indulgences weren't like totally clarified, I'd say, until the, the Council of Trent. However, the things that he was saying was rather crazy where he was basically saying like you give money to me for the rebuilding of St. Peter's and you're going to go to heaven. Like what? Basically, if you have the money, you can afford heaven. That's not Christian. <laughs> or he would say something like, um, quote, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, unquote. Like as soon as you give me money, I put it in the coffer. Maybe one of your dead relatives or someone that you know in purgatory, boom, they're gone from purgatory as soon as you give me money. You notice how this has become simply a business exchange and not like a deeply moving, heartfelt, I am sorry for my sins, God, and I want to make it up to you and I want to show you how sorrowful I am. And I know that you've given me everything and I want to give it all back to you. So I'm going to give donation i'm going to be all um, like uh, to start giving having this generous spirit about me i just want to give to them instead it's about i'm going to buy my way into heaven which is crazy right so oh, yeah so one of the driving forces behind what eventually became this movement of selling indulgences unfortunately was as you said almsgiving and there really is a place for almsgiving in this kind of purgative process that the soul undergoes for sins that have been forgiven. And, and clearly Luther had an understanding of uh, almsgiving in terms of the purification of the soul as well. We see that in the 95 Theses. So we've got a couple of key principles that he hashes out in the 95 Theses, but we want to zoom in right now into indulgences specifically. So let's just start with this. What, what are indulgences? I mean, I remember when I was really young in Malaysia and we had one chapter in our high school history textbooks on the Christian Reformation. And it was plainly and blatantly stated that the Pope at that time, the, the historical facts were very, very poorly hashed out, but it, it was stated that the Pope at that time was selling letters for the forgiveness of sins. Letters for the forgiveness of sins. So you could buy the forgiveness of your sins. Now, that's, that demonstrates a lack of understanding in the people who wrote th those textbooks, but is there this kind of a problem that Luther is seeing as well, that, that it seems that what's being sold is really the forgiveness of sins and a kind of eternal security? So what are indulgences? Yeah, so indulgences, I would try to give an analogy, that way we can kind of get an idea for it. Let's imagine a child. He goes into the kitchen and he's been told he can't have any cookies, but he steals 10 of them anyways takes 10 cookies, his mom doesn't even know about it until the next day. He realizes, oh my gosh, my son ate all the cookies. I told him not to, you're going to be punished for this. So what does he say to him? No TV for the next week. No TV. And the kid's like, yeah, come on. Like, no TV. But then the child's like, his heart really starts to change. He starts realizing, wow, 
I really should not have disobeyed my parents. I love my parents. I love my mom. I love my dad. I want to like please them. I want to bestow glory on them. That's like the fourth commandment, bestow glory on your parents. Like <laughs> I want to love them. You know what? I'm going to make it up to you. I'm going to go do 10 chores and I'm going to go just out of sorrow for my actions. I'm going to write a long letter to my mom saying how sorrowful I am for my action, how I will never do that again. And then the mom comes home and she sees all this, how much her son did this. And she says, "What? Right, you're forgiven. Like you can have TV back. TV people just come back. That's how I want to kind of think of indulgences. We're like, we commit sins. We offend God. So imagine right now, like Luke Lancaster goes over to um, his friend's house and punches him in the face or insults him for no reason. Like, that's a sin. That's an action. Uh, um, sins have consequences. So just as the child who lost TV for the week, God would give a punishment. You can see this very clearly in, like, the example of sin. King David. King David committed murder and adultery. He had adultery with Bathsheba and then ended up killing her husband. What happened? God saw that and God said that his firstborn son was going to die. Notice the consequence of his actions. He committed a sin and then God punished him for it. He disciplined it. God is a father who disciplines his children. That way his children can learn from it. That way they can understand the gravity of the situation. What they did was wrong and they need to like show that what they did was wrong and they need to experience that and sense it. And so there's a punishment for it. So every action that we commit, every sin that we commit has a punishment for it. Now, this is what we call temporal punishment, something that happens in time. So right now, like I would get a punishment from God in some situation, some way for my actions, for my sins. So what do we do then though with those punishments? Well, what happens if I deserve a punishment, but then I die? that punishment is going to actually take place in purgatory. So because I have this undue of like this certain affection for sin, this like, you know, like the child who just committed uh, the action of taking 10 cookies out of the kitchen. Now he needs to be punished for it. So he needs to understand the sin that he committed and he needs to learn from his mistakes. And God is going to basically in purgatory um, take just increase charity in his heart and change the heart. So before God lets somebody into heaven, into his presence, he wants their heart to be perfect like his sons. He wants to, wants them to be totally changed from the inside out. And he knows that we're not totally changed when we die. And so he wants to be perfectly changed. And that's what happens in purgatory. They're cleaned. You know, think about uh, taking a shower or something like that. You're like getting all the filth off. And so like that temporal punishment can either happen on earth or in purgatory. That's where the indulgence comes in though. What about if the child is sorry for the sin that he committed and says, you know, I'm going to do all these extra things to show my sorrow, to show my issue, to show that I was wrong. I understand that it was wrong and I'm sorry that it was wrong. I'm going to make it up to you. Uh, that's what an indulgence is. Uh, if you, the church will offer them because whenever the church can bind and loose, they were given that authority in Matthew 16, 18. We had that video last week. Peter's given that authority. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Um, so Peter has the authority to give an indulgence. He's able to say, you know what? If you do certain actions demonstrating your sorrow for your sins, God isn't going to punish you. You're not going to be punished for the sin that you committed. And remember, these are punishments that we're thinking of in terms that are like venial sin punishments, or if you committed a moral sin that you repented of, like repented of sin. We're not talking about someone who's going to hell. Jesus paid for that. That's eternal punishment. Eternal punishment has done away with. That's forgiven because of Christ. But we're thinking of temporal punishments now. Like we've been saved. We're Christ's body on earth, but we still make mistakes. We make mistakes and they need to be accounted for and we need to understand them and we need to be punished for them. Right. So, uh, but if we get, if we get the idea that we really sinned and we show that that's an indulgence. So we show that we like, 
and like the child who does 10 extra chores and writes that long letter. So what um, in the 1517, the Pope is offering to people, if you are generous in your heart and you're showing yourself for your sins, I will grant you an indulgence. Like whatever I loose on earth, God said, he'll back me up. He'll say, I'll loose that in heaven. So I'm telling you, this is an indulgence for you. So this is what should be preached. This is what Tetzel should be preaching. He should be preaching things like when Jesus said uh, in Luke chapter 11, verse 41, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Everything will be clean for you. Like all is forgiven. Like you just showed in your heart that you're not attached to money and money is crazy for this world. Everybody's talking about money, thinking about money. Uh, all they want is money. But if you're being detached from it and you're being generous with it, everything will be clean for you. Or for example, in the book of Sirach, chapter 3, verse 30, it says, water extinguishes a blazing fire, so almsgiving atones for sin. Right? Almsgiving atones for sin. Or um, Matthew chapter 3, or no, Matthew chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, and you're giving to that guy that's sitting on the side of the road there, when you're giving to the needy, you're giving to your brother who's struggling and lost his job, like, when you're giving to the needy, do not, left your, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. So do it and don't make a big deal of that. Don't tell everybody about how you bring given to all these people and how great you are. Be humble about it. Give. Then your father, God, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. God is going to reward you for the actions that you do. And so that's the indulgence. You are rewarded for your actions. Like you... Um, say to God, I'm sorry, and I'm going to like give. I'm gonna like you've given me everything. I'm gonna give it back to you. I'm gonna give, and so God will reward you, and He'll reward you. How? In this sense, um, the Pope is saying that He'll reward you by deleting your temporal punishment. So that's an indulgence, and indulgences actually can be. Um, you can actually do things for the souls in purgatory as well. So we think about the body of Christ. We're all one body. That means that even if, Marcus, even if you died or if I died tonight, we still would have a connection. Like death does not separate us. We're still the one body of Christ. And I can do things for other people and people that have died, like they're still in God's presence, that are in God's presence. They can do things for me too. Like there's still this connection there. Death didn't separate us. We're still loved by God and we're still people. Um, so sometimes in, in this, in this time period, 15, 17, people were offering things up for their like dead relative that might be in purgatory. You know, if they had somebody that is in purgatory and, you know, God's going to reward you for any good action that you do, if you are being giving and generous with your money, God's going to reward you. What if you said to God, God, I don't want, I don't want to be rewarded by you. Can you give that to my I, uh, you know, my brother who's up in head or who's up in purgatory right now, or who might be in purgatory. Uh, no, God's going to see that. going to be like, wow, like what, like charity. Like I just told him I'd reward him, but he doesn't even want the reward. And so he's going to give the reward to the beloved friend of yours, uh, or relative, whoever it may be, who is there in purgatory. And then they can be like their experience of being like cleaned for heaven can go faster or it can be really quick you know so that's just pretty much the idea of indulgences and the issue is that in 1517 indulgences are not being preached like the way i just explained it it's all about contractual things about you give whoever has a lot of money they're gonna get a lot of indulgences and if you give indulgences you're good like you don't have to like worry about your salvation anymore heaven is guaranteed buddy you're good Woo! You know, listen to some of the things that uh, Martin Luther says in, uh, in his 95 Theses, one of them, for example, um, Theses number uh, 52. It is vain to trust in salvation by indulgence letters, unquote. Like people are thinking that they're going to heaven if they got an indulgence. Or people are thinking that... Um, in order to have like a full forgiveness of sins, you have to get an indulgence. For example, Luther writes in, 
in the 95 Theses number 36, any truly repenting Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. Like you don't need indulgences to get into heaven, people. You don't need an indulgence to avoid purgatory. Like that, it's not a necessary thing. But people are seeing indulgences as if that's the way they get into heaven because of these greedy individual priests like Tetzel. And this is a very sad thing. Like Jesus said, there's going to be weeds among the wheat. Just as Judas was handpicked by Christ, but then rejected Christ. So there can be priests like this who do not live out the teaching of the church and end up hurting the body of Christ and misleading people. It's called a false shepherd. And sadly, that's what was happening in 1517. And I would stand with Martin Luther when he was nailing some of those 95 theses that these things are wrong. People should not be thinking that way. But that's not to say that everything he says in the 95 Theses are good, but some of them are bad. Going back to this, this whole concept of indulgence, is just a kind of fundamental theology on, on indulgences. So, so we know that, just for you listeners, we know that there are really two kinds of indulgences. We've got plenary indulgences and we've got partial indulgences. Both of them hinge upon the, the authority of the keys that we spoke about in uh, our previous podcast and also in this notion of eternal security, which we'll talk about after this. But the fact is, the heir to Peter and all of the bishops who are successors of the apostles and priests possess the same authority of binding and loosing in as much as they're in communion with each other in the Pope, who is himself the successor of St. Peter. So that being said, when we take a look at plenary indulgences, what we're really looking at is this capacity of the Pope or anyone conferring the plenary indulgence to remit, as Luke said, all of the temporary, the temporal consequences of sins that have been forgiven. When we talk about partial indulgences, these are punishments that should take place, they're temporal consequences, but they are remitted only partially, only a part of them is remitted. Plenary indulgences are kind of harder to come by. One example of late where all of the faithful who were present received a plenary indulgence was in faithful participation in Pope Francis's historic monumental Urbi et Orbi, where he sought the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and he sought prayers from the Lord for the sake of the ending of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic across the world. Anyone receiving of that blessing in a worthy manner receives with it the plenary indulgence, this remittance of all the temporal consequences of their sins that have been forgiven. With this, we just like to move into a kind of closing consideration of Luther's 95 Theses. What we need to understand, and we will talk about some of these other concepts in later podcasts. But what we need to understand over here is when we take a look at Luther's 95 Theses, we are seeing that Luther is arguing against a kind of false eternal security that the faithful are placing in indulgence letters for their salvation. So this is almost to the point of negation of faithfully following Jesus Christ, of a life fully committed to Jesus Christ. Now, along the way, we will see that historically Luther begins to change his theological perspective, and he starts going down the path of a simplistic, nominalistic expression of the faith. And there we get these principles of sola fide and sola scriptura. But precisely within the 95 Theses, allow me to quote two particular theses in the whole document. In 94, Luther writes, Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ, their head through penalties, death, and hell, and thus, 95, and thus be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. So over here, what's going on is a negation of placing one's entire salvation in these indulgences that have been bought. So as we conclude this podcast, what we want to rest everyone on is the notion that indulgences do not forgive sins. They do not guarantee salvation. All they do is allow for the purification of a soul that has been forgiven of its sins already. So uh, yeah, sins like sins that you have committed in the past, not future sins. Right, exactly. Since it have been committed in the past already, that have been forgiven. 
So with that, we'd like to close our podcast for today. On behalf of Luke Lancaster, I'm Marcus Peter. Luke is the Director of Biblical Apologetics for the St. Peter Institute for Scripture and Evangelization, and I'm Marcus Peter, the President of the Institute. God bless you and keep you, and stay tuned for our next podcast. Yeah, grace and peace.